Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Christian Lippert and um, this is my colleague Sebastian Mansky. Um, we were both uh, doing the talk because uh, we both worked on the project. And um, yeah, the talk is about uh, how we moved from virtual machines to containers in our continuous integration infrastructure, uh, which allowed us to uh, gain build reproducibility, isolation, and scalability. Um, just a quick look at the agenda. Um, I give a quick introduction about what Camunda is, uh, company and software. And then I will t uh, talk about the dark age, what we call it in uh, Camunda. Um, Sebastian will talk a bit, uh, will uh, then uh, take over and talk about the promising present we're currently in. Uh, we'll, we'll give you some uh, lessons learned during our continuous integration rebuild. And uh, then we uh, will give a quick outlook about the bright future uh, we're hoping to achieve. So, um, Camunder is, uh, was founded in 2008 as a BPM consulting uh, company. If you don't know what BPM is, it's business process management. So, um, you're uh, basically managing your business processes from, um, to your customers. And um, in 2010, we uh, introduced uh, Hudson in our uh, consulting projects for some small consulting projects where we, do, we did internally. 2011, we adapted Jenkins, and uh, 2012, we uh, decided to become a BPM software vendor. So uh, it was a strategic decision, and um, then it became aware that Jenkins was a really critical, uh, mission critical system for our uh, company, and uh, it was then treated as such. Uh, 2014, we um, uh, founded uh, Camuna Inc. in San Francisco to, uh, for the North American company, uh, continent. Uh, we currently have around 30 full-time employees. Um, we do not have any external funding, so we do not have any money to burn, so we have to make, really make use uh, of our resources. And uh, our average turnover growth per year is uh, now around 50%. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's uh, just a quick uh, show. What is this? This is a BPMM process. It's um, BPMM is a standard from the OMG. It's business process model and annotation. And um, yeah, basically, this, uh, uh, you can model this one uh, and execute it with our platform. Uh, sometimes you can, uh, it looks like a Jenkins workflow when you would visualize it. Um, Camunda BPM is an open source platform for workflow and business process automation, I said that. And uh, we tightly integrate with uh, seven application servers, um, or diff F diff 11 different versions, six databases, um, around 17 different versions, and we currently have one development branch and four maintained versions. So um, we have to test every Camunda BPM um, version against 187 com uh, combinations of uh, database and app server. And uh, we also check all the JDKs, so that's another uh, I have JDKs, 11 JDKs. And uh, this makes around uh, 400 jobs per version we have to manage. And um, biannually we release a new terminal BPM version which puts another 400 jobs into our CI pipeline. And uh, for our customers, we, uh, we uh, buy support from us. We uh, offer 24-7 uh, support, and uh, we uh, also gave, uh, gave, give them uh, fixed time. So um, it's really critical that uh, when we uh, do fixes, that, are, uh, that they pass through the CI pipeline, and so the system isn't allowed to go down. Okay, um, the dark age, why I had to change um, the reason, or let's say the numbers first. Uh, we had one Jenkins master with a lot of plugins, it was really customized. Um, it, uh, has, it had eight Jenkins slaves, VMs, um, and around 1,000 jobs totally, configured manually, um, or partially by a script. Uh, for uh, these this 1,000 jobs consisted of uh, four Camunda BPM versions. We also have um, 
allow contributors of community projects to use our CI, and uh, we also just for the websites and for some maintenance jobs. So um, the problems we had during the dark age. Um, one problem we had was uh, scalability because uh, our unit tests and integration tests need either a database and, or an application server or both. And uh, most of the time we are using H2, but when we have to test against the real databases, it was uh, really a mess because uh, it wasn't so easy to spin up a database. We had a, a static database for uh, a static database, so one Postgres, one MySQL, one SQL server, and um, all jobs use the same database, so you had to manage all uh, new schemas for each job, uh, credentials for each job, and so on, so to, to, uh, to really uh, scale. And that's what, uh, and uh, to really, um, Isolate the jobs from another, so the, the uh, previous run job did not, uh, left, uh, had, uh, did not leave any leftovers for the new job. Um, so, and every half a year a new job, a new version was, um, was, um, was introduced and they used the same database, so it was really a mess. Um, we had no scalability because, uh, like I said, one Jenkins, it had four executors. We used, uh, uh, we built on the master Jenkins, which is not good practice. Um, we had eight static uh, heterogeneous slave VMs, uh, each had one executor. And the uh, jobs were tied to slave labels. I like, I think most of you are doing that. And this was not so scalable for us, like we thought in the beginning, and um, basically the slaves restrict the database access um, and guaranteeing isolation through this that no other build uh, is accessing the same database at the moment. So um, we also had some maintenance problems. We, um, when we upgraded Jenkins or tried to upgrade Jenkins or any plugins, there were several side effects because this wasn't um, really a mess and when uh, our uh, product manager asked us if you can support a new database or a new app server version, then we told him, yeah, we can do that, but it will take a lot of time for, uh, to install the database, setting up the right jobs and everything. And uh, when we would release a new version of Kamuna BPM, the necessary jobs had to be created too. We did it. First we did it by hand, uh, then we switched to GUI scripting, but this wasn't really practical. And um, although we had only a small part of our infrastructure uh, ready for disaster recovery, and we never tested it. So um, another problem we had was because um, we used those slave VMs as only one executor, uh, tied to the databases, the feedback cycle for the developers became really, really long because when there was a build coming and uh, someone committed something and then the chain was triggered, there were around, let's say, five to 10 jobs um, before the actual uh, commit of the committer, before the actual build of the committer, which, uh, which, would, allow, uh, which would run. And um, another problem was when there was a failure in our um, CI environment, our developers were unable to reproduce the CI environment it was currently running in. So um, we did some crude hacks, but it was, <laughs> they were unsuccessful. And so um, this was most of the time, or sometimes what the best guess is a CI related problem or was it a product related problem. And our QA engineers um, have a bloated test set up too. They, have, uh, they are using a gigantic virtual machine, let's think about 50 gigabytes or something with all installed, with all uh, databases, all app servers installed. So uh, it's quite a mess. It's, it was quite a mess in the dark age. So it's uh, it's time. It was time to change because uh, we had so much pain with all the infrastructure and um, the ship was already sinking. So uh, we decided um, the idea of a new infrastructure arise, applying by applying best practices uh, from the industry. 
And um, this was around, I think the idea for it, became, um, I think it was around June, June 14. And um, yeah. So um, Sebastian will give you a, an overview of the present. After you now have a clue uh, why we should change something, I want to present you what we have achieved and what is our current situation. Um, we achieved that our configuration and all the infrastructure is now as code saved in a, in a um, version control system, so we can really, there is no manual configuration and we have the version control history to see the changes and can review changes also. We now have isolated and reproducible jobs and we can scale our CI infrastructure as we want. So to achieve this, we uh, set up three simple rules. First, every configuration has to be checked in in version control. Every application or test that is running in our CI has to be in a Docker container and every Docker image is built automatically. So the first point means that for our applications like Jenkins, Nexus, and so on, we use Docker and also for our test environments, so for the different databases. And for our jobs in the Jenkins, we use job DSL, so we can maintain them separately. Um, for every application runs in a Docker container means we now have different images for our applications, as I said, for our test infrastructure, and also we have images for our build infrastructure. So we have images which use Docker and Docker to build Docker images. So we build Docker images in our Docker images. And also we build KVM images inside Docker and then pack them inside Docker to run them inside Docker. <laughs> so everything runs in Docker, which is awesome. And yes, and the last one is we now have an own Jenkins which builds our Docker and KVM images and then publish them to our private repository where we can use them. And to run them, we use our current flows like uh, you check in in the Commander CI uh, repository which are on our infrastructure repositories. It then is built by our infrastructure Jenkins and published to the uh, private registry. <coughs> And these images are used with the Kamunda source code to build a real artifact. And also these Jenkinses are also Docker images which are built by the first Jenkins and everything runs on the Docker Swarm. So what have we achieved with that? Fully isolation. And we can now have own Jenkins for own jobs. So we don't have one Jenkins which builds our CI and also do releases and also build some web pages and some stuff for the marketing team, so now we can have a Jenkins for every team. Of course, it's just another Docker image, so it's a branch from our Docker image with some custom configuration and some other plugins they need, and not all Jenkins need every plugin, and so this reduces the point of failure. And um, we now have every job as a one-shot Docker container, so there are no leftovers, there are no interference with other jobs, and the database settings are now well documented in the Docker files and also they can really be simple like password, username, Kamuna, Kamuna, because they aren't accessible from outside. So everybody knows what the password is in the username because it's always the same. And yes, as I mentioned, they are stored in a private registry and this gives us the opportunity to use them as developer also locally, but also our QR engineers can now use them to build their test environment on top of this and don't have to use this uh, flunky VM. And scalability. Um, as I said, we use a Docker plugin with a Docker Swarm as a Docker cloud. And this means if we want to scale, we just bought a new machine, add it to the Swarm, and that's it. Jenkins doesn't, know, doesn't have to know which, how many machines there are. The Docker Swarm will do the scheduling. And it just works. We started with. Um, some old hardware that was lying around in the office and nobody used. And after we see it worked, we started to, build, to buy new machines. And now we currently have six Docker hosts as one swarm. Everybody has, uh, every host has uh, four executors. So now we have 24 executors and one infrastructure host where our all infrastructure like Jenkins, Nexus, and so on is uh, running on. And yeah, that's, uh, a little bit old photo, there was just uh, three build slaves, but you can see we also used an old MacBook for this time. 
as a build slave. And this is our infrastructure host, and these three boxes are our build slaves. Uh, last week, there were we added two more, and yeah, this this are really cheap commodity hardware for core PCs with uh, 16 gigabyte of RAM and um, solid state disk, and they're really fast, and it uh, it improved also the job execution for us. So, what are the advantages of system using? Um, First of all, it's really easy now to add new test environments on new databases. Just if you want a new MySQL version, just go to the MySQL Docker image repository, make a branch for the new version, change the file to install and some configuration if needed, and then the build will, all, will automatically, our Jenkins will automatically build this image, push it to a registry, and then our Jenkins can use it to build new jobs. And to get these jobs for the new uh, database, we just have to go to the job DSL repository and add a string to a constant where all our databases are. And then the jobs will automatically generate it for the new database. Um, this is also true for a new Camunda release. We just fork our job DSL, uh, not fork, branch our fork DSL repos uh, job DSL repository. And now we have the jobs for 7.3, for example, and 7.4. And it's no problem. And we can now fully parallelize our job execution. This means we can have 12 jobs of SQL Server in parallel. It's no problem because it's, they are running somewhere and uh, Docker Swarm is taking the work. Um, yeah, and we now have testable infrastructure, which is also very important because now we can, every developer can set up a new Jenkins on his own laptop and test if the new plugin is already working or if the new plugin is broken or is this plugin the right one. And so something we couldn't have done beforehand. And now also we have a minimized administration overhead, which means we don't have to talk to our admins to add a new database or to add a new slave, just our admin buys a new machine, he sets up Ubuntu and installs the latest Docker and sets it. Um, yeah, we, uh, we both uh, worked three months on that. We started in January and finished end of March. Uh, we now have a fully scalable, isolated and reproducible CI infrastructure. We have really faster feedback for the developers and the developers also started to use these Docker containers to locally test them against spe specific database versions and so on. And our product owners, of course, also very happy. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Okay, um, some lessons learned during our voyage, uh, during our rebuild. So, um, yeah, regarding the architecture of our CI infrastructure, um, we, uh, we tried many things, and, uh, but in the end it was just, uh, you have to automate as much as you can. Um, this includes the Jenkins configuration, the plugins uh, you are using in Jenkins, um, the jobs, uh, job configuration using the job DSL, um, and f uh, for sure the environment creation using Docker. So uh, this was really a key uh, for us, and uh, this really speeded up our development and our uh, uh, for, for our developers. And um, yeah, and you should uh, uh, you should uh, try um, before before you implement your infrastructure. You should try to. Um, uh, how how uh, how are you how good you can scale? Uh, so we uh, took our uh, prototype of our infrastructure on EC2 and uh, tried to um, to um, try how we can um, how far we can go with it. And uh, this was really awesome and uh, it was really quick. I think uh, we set up our development environment in EC2 from uh, from nothing to full in around 50 minutes was just uh, pushing one docker image and starting it and then executing one script and um, we uh, and then we tested uh, what kind of machines we need for our builds um, uh, um, as it come, uh, the outcome was we uh, needed for each build we need around four gig of ram and one cpu and um, the bottleneck was the um, I/O uh, uh, stats, so we uh, switched to SSDs. And uh, yeah, basically um, 
this allowed us um, uh, this also allowed us to support um, our the business agility of our company because um, when now our product owner comes to us uh, and says yeah we can we uh, can we use the database or do we support this version and we can say yeah sure let me give me 10 15 minutes and I can uh, give you back the results um, yeah, second, le uh, second uh, lesson learned, uh, it was testing. Um, we didn't test anything at all first. And then um, after we um, created Jenk uh, out of the Jenkins Docker image and um, configured the pl uh, installed the plugins, um, we did a small, uh, uh, we made a small error or a, a false assumption. We uh, always installed the latest plugins. Um, that wasn't so good because uh, it usually broke the build some, uh, somehow of the Docker image. And uh, also one particular um, moment I remember is when we upgrade, I think we upgraded the release plugin in Jenkins by just a patch level or so. And then um, everything was fine, it was working, and, um, but we uh, rely on the release button. And uh, when there was when there uh, was a time there should be a main release, uh, the release button was gone. So it wasn't, uh, yeah. So we quickly wrote the back to change and uh, installed the latest, uh, spin up the latest uh, Jenkins, which uh, was working. And um, yeah, you should also test the job generation when you're using the job DSL because. Um, there are, sometimes there uh, uh, can be the case there are some um, misconfiguration or you're making a change in the job DSL and the outcome uh, doesn't reflect what you wanted. And um, I think we had it. I think I think we had it that um, I made a change and uh, suddenly all uh, br branches of the latest version. Uh, all jobs of the latest version weren't uh, working on the false branch. We're working on the false branch. And um, yes, you should also test your Docker images. Um, we, um, we use some uh, server, uh, server spec from Ruby, or you can also use BATS. So you, can do, uh, you should make sure that your Docker image you created and you spin up and spin them up that they. Um, <clears throat> when you spin them up, that they uh, really uh, offer the uh, services uh, for your um, uh, what you what, what you uh, expect from them. And um, yeah, like I said, uh, we test the scalability. I think when you implement some solution and you want really want to scale, you have to test it. And uh, we also test the uh, we also test the disaster recovery <laughs> because. Was critical when a customer is calling and some colleague is uh, woke up by the call and, and at, at night at 3 uh, a.m. and then um, the uh, Jenkins is gone and he can't uh, push out the fix for the customer. Uh, it's it's really hard, uh, really um, a concern for us now. Um, yeah, lessons learned. Um, Job DSL, you should unit test the job generation. I think uh, the creator of the job DSL plugin said it yesterday. Or, uh, and um, we also write some job generator classes to abstract the most common build logic of our jobs out of the box. So uh, when the developers are adding new jobs, they just the new they have, uh, the settings are already in there and they only have to add uh, some more. There's also the possibility to override it, but um, most of the time it's uh, working like it should. Uh, we do that for, um, we have, so we have the job generator for three styles, Maven job, release job generator, and so on. And um, when you really want to uh, check your changes when, with the job DSL, when, when you upgrade the job DSL or using a different plugin or something like that, um, we um, using XML diffing because it's groovy. You can easily include XML unit and uh, compare the previous generated job, which is stored in um, source control, with a newly generated job, and you can visually see the difference. And, and if it says okay, so 
All right. Yeah, um, Docker. Docker. Um, as we learned, um, you can run mainly everything in Docker, and also you can run Docker in Docker, and as you can see here, you can also run Windows in Docker, because you can run KVM images inside Docker. And we found this idea by the Rancher IO guys, and adapted it for our use case, and now we are completely gone with uh, KEMU or KVM on the host directly, so we're just using it inside Docker. Um, plugins, as Christian mentioned, please pin your plugin versions because they will break everything. If you really often spin up a new Jenkins or redeploy a Jenkins <laughs> and then the latest plugins will be installed, you don't know what happened. So it would, it's best to say which plugin version you want to have and pin this in your configuration in a Docker file, for example, and only download them. And when you want to upgrade it, just spin up a new Jenkins, test the upgrade if it's working, and then commit it. Um, also, you should be prepared to contribute to plugins for Jenkins or maintain an own branch. For example, we used a Docker plugin, and as we started with it, it wasn't really stable, and we had many problems with this because it doesn't spin up the right instances, or it took too long, or it was false or wrong instance or something like this. So we began to fork this repository and fix it for us and also try to give something back to the master, but it's a little bit strange. And um, also choose always the right plugin and not install too much plugins because every plugin is a point of failure. Our current top plugins are JobDSL and Docker plugin, also build failure analyzer because um, it helps you to easily spot the if the problem is inside the code or is it an infrastructure problem. Um, yeah, control is important also. As for the plugins, it's, it's also the same for every other thing you use. For example, if you want to test against a specific database, make it explicit. Don't use the package manager of Debian or CentOS to install Postgres because this version can change. Or if you upgrade your CentOS, you may become another version of Postgres, so always say which version you really want and don't use latest or something. Um, also, my, my, uh, make an own mirror for the important packages. For example, we really support many JDKs, and some JDKs you can't download anywhere from Oracle, so it's best to have some for you or also for older databases or something. We often have to we often have to support software which isn't maintained anymore because our customers are using them, so it's important to have some copy of it. Um, yeah, so that's what we got today, and that's now we'll come to the point where what we're planning for the future. Now that we have Jenkins for everyone, we can also create finally a public community Jenkins because today it's we built the community projects, but most community members don't have access to our Jenkins. But now we don't have this problem anymore, so we can create an own Jenkins for them, and everybody can maintain their own project if they want to. Also, we will provide a small web app for our developers in QR to quickly spin up the required environment for their testing, so it will be easier for them, and they don't need Docker locally, so they can just use our Swarm for that. Um, also, we started as we rebuild with uh, local machines, so um, we can faster have a faster progress and just have them locally and don't mess with the Jenkins in the data center. We now want to go back to the data center. And this is also possible with Swarm, as Swarm allows you to uh, spin up Docker hosts with specific labels, and then when you want to run a Docker container, you can say it has to be a host with this label, and so you can have one Swarm which has hosts locally and also remote, and then your job decides where to run this. So we started to work on this one. It seems to work. There's, all, there's again a problem in the Docker plugin, but we are working on it. Um, yeah, and also we want, uh, currently, if the infrastructure Jenkins builds the new Docker images, he <coughs> pushes it to the, uh, to the private registry and then pulls it on all hosts which need this image, but it doesn't redeploy this. And we want to build, we also want to automate this, so if the Jenkins image is tested and it's fine, it should be redeployed by the Jenkins itself. And um, Christian started to work on centralized logging and monitoring with, with Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. 
as we now have many different Jenkins, we want to have the logs somehow centralized and want to analyze them. Um, for example, you can see here, we can see now um, where the builds run, which Docker image is used the most, how many um, tests are failing, and so on, and all, um, all Jenkies. And also it gives us a chance to make some, uh, I don't think you can read that. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> we can now analyze which test cases are often broken and so can start to work on these unstable test cases which we weren't able beforehand. Um, yeah, um, that's it. Uh, some resources, there's an own organization on GitHub with some public repositories from us. Um, there's a job.jsl Gradle example which has some nice ideas and we used it to start our own job.jsl from this one. And of course you can test the Camunda BPM platform also as a Docker image if you want to. Um, yeah, we are still looking for good people and if you're interested, come join us and work with us. And yeah, thanks for your attention. So I think we have some time left for questions. Yeah. yeah? Uh, how many different Docker images do you get and what are the different, different types of Docker um, We now ha we have currently um, seven application images, which are uh, Jenkins, Nexus, an FTP server, and Nginx as reverse proxy, and so on. Then we have, I think, around 35 test environments, which are database configurations. So uh, DB2, DB2 in uh, other versions, um, Oracle, SQL Server, and so on. And then we have two images which are built infrastructure images. This is the Docker and Docker image and the uh, um, Docker with Kemu and Packer image. So in the sum around 40, 50 images. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what approach do you use for the Jenkins configuration and job definition backup and restore for the new environment? Uh, the Jenkins configuration we add to the Docker image. That's the main configuration. There's, uh, we just uh, um, spun up uh, Jenkins, copied the configuration from it, and modified it as we want to. And then there's a Groovy script which adds uh, Docker images to the Jenkins configuration on startup. So we, of course, it's a little bit messy. You have to add a cloud, and then you have to define every image this cloud knows. And this is done by a Groovy script on startup. And the job DSL is then integrated in the Jenkins by CJob, as shown by the job DSL maintainer. Um, so we have a separate repository for the job DSL. Yeah? Can you tell me a little bit about the Docker Swarm plugin? Because I'm not too familiar with it. No, it's not a Docker Swarm. It's a Docker plugin, the normal Docker plugin. But we pointed not to one Docker host. It's a Docker Swarm instance. Docker Swarm is just an, a tool from Docker which allows you to bundle multiple Docker hosts under one inf interface. So it, for the Jenkins, it looks like there's one Docker host, but it, actually it's a swarm, and the swarm has uh, currently four or five build slaves. And a swarm also supports some uh, scheduling algorithms. We use the even scheduler, because uh, then he will, uh, you, uh, the Jenkins will start a new job, this will start a new Docker container and swarm. The swarm decides where to start this Docker container and we'll uh, schedule them evenly on our build slips. So the Docker container will be started dynamically? Yeah. It will pick up, oh, there's a, this, this image is needed, so it will... Yeah, there's, yeah. Uh, yeah. there's a job, the job has a label that has to run. Uh, uh, in a normal situation, the Jenkins has no executors, and then the job will be started, the label says which image, then the Docker plugin will start a Docker container with, for this label, and then this Docker image is started on the swarm, and the swarm decides where to start this. But still, it's appearing as one slave uh, to, uh, to Jenkins. And Every container is an own slave, which is started for Jenkins. It's an own slave, which is started and then turned down after it's done. Any further question? Mm. Yeah? Yeah, you, you talked some about testing configuration changes, things like plugin updates, before you commit those yeah. Yeah, to, to the live system. How much of that kind of testing is automated and how much is manual? 
Currently, it's mainly manual testing of this changes because we didn't find a good solution to test plug and updates without starting at Jenkins and look if everything is working. As Christian mentioned, we had different problems. For example, one time a release button disappeared, another time uh, some jobs doesn't load anymore, and one time there was a problem that uh, our signing doesn't work anymore, and we didn't know why, because some plugin was updated. So currently, we don't know how to automate us, really. Yeah? Are you with the, the plugin version in the Docker pod, or do you update it in the Jenkins instance when it's running? Have you exported the configuration? No. It's in the, uh, in the Jenkins Docker image. There's a script with, uh, there's a file with all plugins and the version with them. And then there's a script when the Docker image is built that these plugins are downloaded by Curl, with Curl, and so on. And then we pin all plugins, because if you don't pin the plugins and Jenkins starts, he will install another version of core plugins as you want it. Yeah? Um, you said you can run Windows inside Docker. Can yeah. you uh, talk a bit more about how you do this? Uh, easy. <laughs> no. Um, you just have a Docker container which has a PMU installed, and then you have to make sure that this Docker container can access the KVM of the host machine, which you do by running as, as privileged, so it has more chance to get it. And then you just run KMU with the KVM images and just boot it up a Windows image. And then we do port forwarding from the Windows image to the Docker container, and then we can access it from outside. Because we access all our images about as, uh, over SSH. Yeah, you can have a look at the Orange IO guys. They did the, uh, they first did this stuff, and uh, we just adopted it and modified it for us. He asked uh, how we can uh, how we manage to test the upgrade of the Jenkins uh, if the, these jobs need these Docker images to run. I think. Yeah. Slaves, Docker slaves, yeah, or the slaves for the jobs. Um, if you, um, as a Jenkins, as a Docker image, you can start it locally. And it has a configuration for the Docker Swarm, which you can access, of course, from your machine locally. So you can run tests from your local machine. You just have the Jenkins master, but the jobs are executed on the Swarm, so you can just start in Jenkins locally for you, and the jobs are um, run on the swarm, so it's no difference where the Jenkins is started. So you have a full Jenkins installation on your local machine with all the plugins, and you can test everything manually currently. Yeah, you can also uh, just configure your local Docker host and use that as to spin up your, when you have the necessary images on your hard disk. Otherwise, you have to pull it first down. Well, maybe this could be done automatically, I think. Further question? Another question? Okay, I think we're done. Thanks for your okay. attention. Thanks.